So, what is your、um, expectation and plans for the future? This is a tough question in a way because <laughs> in medical school we have to start thinking about what we want to do in the future. Before I got into medical school, I thought all the doctors are just doctors.、Mm-hmm. And then you get into medical school and you realize there's like a million different specialties.、Um, you can do, be an internist, but if you choose internal medicine, for example, you can do allergy, you can do gastrointestinal,、um, you know, specialist. You can be endocrinologist. There's just so many different specialties. It's so hard to choose what you want to do, and I've always been somebody that loves quick environments and stressful environments. So I thought that I wanted to do surgery, and so in when I was in first and second year of medical school, I did a lot of research projects in surgery, and I was very involved in the in the surgical community because I wanted to make sure I match into a surgical specialty of choice. But as I am almost done my third year of medical school, and I've done a lot of surgical surgical rotations so far, I actually realized that I don't really love how busy and how you're not in control of your time. So as a surgeon, there are a lot of emergencies. Oftentimes, you have to be waking up in the middle of the night and come to the hospital to operate at two a.m., three a.m., sometimes the whole night, and I didn't. Enjoy that. Even though I thought it was very cool and interesting, and that you're saving lives, I didn't love having to leave my life to go to the hospital. I felt like I always have to sacrifice. It's always sacrifice, and and I I really appreciate the surgeons that do want to sacrifice. But I realized that what makes me happy is to be able to spend time with my family, to be able to. Exercise when I want to, and not wake up every day at 3 a.m. to exercise, and to, you know, and also to do the other things I enjoy. So I, at this moment, I have chosen I'm in family medicine, and I'm also going to specialize in dermatology. So I'm going to do a family medicine for two years plus one year of dermatology. How about your psychologist consulting? I will probably still do that because I really love it, and there's a lot of overlap in medicine and psychology. So as a as a family doctor, we also diagnose ADHD. We also diagnose some mental health disorders like depression, anxiety. As a psychological associate, my main job is to diagnose learning disabilities, ADHD, autism, as well as depression, anxiety, and those kind of mental health illnesses. So lots of overlap. So I also want to continue doing that and maybe. Have a portion of my family medicine practice dedicated into, you know, psych- psychological、um, assessments as well. So that's definitely in the plans. <laughs> I feel lots of people they have the men- mental problem. Yeah. So, mental health is a big part of family medicine. Yeah. It's it's unfortunate to be honest because nowadays it's very stressful. So a lot of people do become stressed, and anxious, and it is a big part of family medicine practice. So do you have any advice? An encouragement for the student who want to pursue in this path. Yes,、yeah, so I have three big advices.、Um, number one is don't give up. I applied four times to medical school, and I could have given up, but I didn't, and I got in. And there are people in my class that have applied ten times. There's someone who's 37 years old. There's someone who's 47 years old. So if you if this is the, something that you want to do, don't give up, and you will make it there. And like I said, there's a lot of luck involved sometimes. And my number two advice is that. If there's something else you like better than medicine, don't do medicine. <laughs> the truth is, medicine is actually all about sacrifice. I know that people, when you want to do medicine and you cannot get into medical school, you kind of put it at a pedestal and you just think that this is the best thing in the world. When I got after I got into medical school, I realized that this is the biggest sacrifice I've ever made in my entire life. I quit a job that was very comfortable and easy, and I loved into something that's very difficult, and it only gets harder and harder. And you know, I don't get to sleep. <laughs> I am constantly working. I don't have time for anything. Ask my mom; she always complains I don't have time for her. <laughs> and it's so. If there's something you love more than medical school. Don't don't choose medical school because it's not <laughs> worth it. <laughs> My third advice for somebody that wants to apply for medical school is that when you choose what you want to do in, in for your university degree, I actually don't recommend doing life sciences like I did. So I did four years in life sciences. 
and after I finished my university, there was no job for me. My degree was completely useless um, because people that do life sciences, they have to apply to dental school, medical school, optometry, and if you don't get in, then you're a failure. <laughs> so I, um, but you don't, they don't need you to do life sciences degree. You can do an arts degree and go to medical school. You can be a professional. There's a guy in my class who's a professional rugby, rugby, uh, rugby player. So you don't have to do life sciences. So do something that's practical that you can actually find a job. Like enge engineering is great, um, especially computer engineering, make lots of money working for Microsoft <laughs> and you can still apply to medical school with that degree and they actually like it more. They want you to be more well-rounded. So, you know, don't just do life sciences. And also it's harder to get good marks if you just do life sciences. I think that's very precious uh, suggestion. Nowadays AI develops very fast. How do you think the AI will impact the medical field? Actually, AI is part of our medical school training nowadays there because this, this really helps medicine. So for example, in a family medicine practice, so if you go to see a family doctor, a big part of the family doctor's job is to take notes and it takes so long to take notes. So a new model has developed where they will have AI in the room. So the AI will actually record the whole conversation and then it will process the conversation and automatically write the notes on behalf of the doctor. So you don't have to take any notes. You just talk to the patients normally, you save time and you know, and, and you can see more patients. So this is actually really helping medicine. Um, another area of um, AI that everyone uses is that we as medical students, as residents, and even as attending doctors, we all use AI to ask about what is the con uh, what is the diagnosis for the patient. <laughs> we often ask our, our phone and then we says, the patient comes in with this symptom, these symptoms and the test showed this, what's the diagnosis? <laughs> AI is almost 95% correct. <laughs> so I heavily rely on this. And then I tell my attending the diagnosis, they're always like, wow, how did you know this? <laughs> so it's definitely, a, I think it's only for the better. Yes, and I think that a lot of people are worried that AI, you know, will replace doctors. But actually, a big part of being a doctor is not just to give a diagnosis and treat the patient. A big part of the of being a doctor is is the emotional support for the patient. Right. It's to show that you care, to show that you are there for them, and for somebody for the patient to trust and rely on. And I don't think any AI can do that. Yeah, I, I hope they don't because I I. Why, why, why would I spend so much time in medical school? <laughs> Actually, we don't. Re they don't really consider the race of the student. Okay. But that's uh, there's there is an exception. So we don't have a lot of black doctors, and we don't have a lot of Aboriginal doctors. So if you're indigenous or you are of black descendant, then we actually reserve spots for these students and we actually lower the requirement. We have five spots that's reserved for indigenous individuals. And we actually didn't get to fill all five because it's, um, we didn't have enough applicants with enough that meet the requirement. So we only fill three of them. We also have five that's reserved for black students. So if you're black or you're indigenous, you um, you have reserved spots in many many schools. But if you're Chinese, unfortunately, we have a lot of Chinese. Doctors. <laughs> so it's it's not uh, it doesn't I don't think it makes a difference. Actually, a third of my class are Caucasian, and a third of my class is uh, South Asian, and then another third is uh, East Asian. So it is kind of distribution of most medical schools. I would say my medical school probably has more Caucasians, I and mean, we take a lot of uh, rural individuals. So those that live in a rural area. So, so if you finish your um, doctor doctor school in Canada, can you practice in US? Or if you want to practice in US, what what's more you have to do? Yeah. So the Canadian MD degree is actually the most valuable in all of the world because as a Canadian medical doctor, you can practice anywhere in the world. Really? Yeah. Um, if you are a fully licensed medical doctor in Canada. You, most of the time you can just go to the United States and you don't need anything to practice if you have some experience already. Obviously, if you're a new graduate, you may they may ask you to take an extra exam that you have to, a licensing kind of exam um, that you have to pass to practice. But you can also 
bypass that if you already have 10 years experience in Canada and you decide to move to Florida. I actually had a preceptor who was an anesthesiologist and he didn't have to take any exams. He's pra he practiced in Canada for 20 years and now he wants to retire in Florida. So he just <laughs> went there to practice. Mm -hmm. So as a Canadian medical doctor, you can practice anywhere in the world. Um, it's not true for other countries, unfortunately. So if you graduated from schools in the in Ireland or in, in in the UK, you do need to write a few more exams to be able to practice in Canada. But as a Canadian doctor, you can practice there usually without any extra requirements. Yes, it uh, it actually is the hardest to get in because we only have 17 medical schools in all of Canada. Three of them are French speaking, so that's reserved for Quebecois who speak French. Um, one of them is only for individuals from Northern Ontario. So really there are only 13 spots for the, all of Canada. Whereas in the U.S. there are hundreds of medical schools for the population. I know that there are more people in the U.S. but they just have so many more medical schools. Um, and also in Canada, medical degree is, the, is looked more prestigiously than other degrees. Uh, in the U.S. If you are in software engineering, you're, you make more money. <laughs> really? <laughs> so people don't really care for doctors there. Do you think is it true? Government control the number of doctors? Yeah, so uh, in Canada, the government pays the majority of our medical school training. So even though, like I said, we pay $25,000 a year for medical school, it's actually not even half the price that's required for our training. So each medical student and each future doctor that they train is a huge investment from the government. So because of that, um, the government only has so much money to pay for the students. So they give each school a certain number of students. So we only accepted 171 students. It's not an even number just because yeah. every student is you know, a big investment from the government. So because of that, um, the schools are very selective. They want to make sure that the government cannot waste their money. That's why it's very hard to get it.